Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners. In this episode, I was asked to be on the Dad Challenge podcast again. I've been on there a few times, and I just thought I would play that for you. I talk with Jeff and and Josh about sexuality and male sexuality and masturbation and a lot of things. Uh, they're concerned about a lot of those issues, about having high libido as opposed to their partner who might, who might have a low libido, having kids and all that kind of stuff. So let's get into it. What do you say? Okay, everybody. Um, this episode, we're talking about a lot of stuff, a lot of uh, sex, and we brought on uh, the sexiest psychologist that we know. He is. He's got the sexiest sure, voice. Sexy. Yep. And he's coming on to talk to us today about the psychology uh, behind sex and all the issues that we uh, have going on with it. Yeah. Dr. Kirk, thanks so much for coming back on. Thanks for having me. I didn't know you felt about me that way. That's, that's exciting. <laughs> well, yes, you do. I've said it almost every time. <laughs> all right. So right off the top, like let's get right into the, the yeah, juiciness of it. Start talking about it. Dr. Kirk, do people need sex? Yes. Not all. <laughs> He's okay, going to say I, procreate. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> no, no. Mo, mo, uh, it, well, it's very much sex. Uh, it, it, we want to have sex regardless of procreation. Obviously, right. that's where the drive comes from for a lot of species of animals. But yeah, we have a need for, for, for sex. Again, not all people. There are uh, probably 1% to 3% of the population around the planet who doesn't need sex at all, doesn't really want it. Uh, not because of necessarily trauma or they're not with the right person, but they seem to be born that way. Okay. Um, but for 97 to 98, 99%, of the uh, other people, absolutely. There's, and it should be acknowledged that there's a spectrum of needs. Some people seem to have more of a need and are much more interested, and some people are not for various different reasons. I'd say, would you not agree? Then the majority of that high, what's the word? High, high, high drive. High drive is male. Well, certainly, when you look at um, people and you study them because so, it's all self-report, right? So you have to just ask people mm -hmm. how often you think about sex or how much do you want sex? And so it's hard to know biologically, which is, uh, you know, if we're looking at cis women and cis men who are uh, quote unquote more, uh, you know, higher libido or not, mm -hmm. because even when you look at our cultures over time, there, there have been cultures around the world and even in Western culture where, uh, your dog agrees with me. Um, <laughs> the uh, where uh, women were seen as the high libido gender and men were seen as more conservative. So it it seems to be that uh, at the very least, men and women's libido uh, seems to be fairly similar on average. But culture plays a pretty big role in shaping how that libido is shaped. And plus, and maybe we'll get into it later, there's a lot of things that impact women's libido that don't necessarily impact uh, men in the same way. For example, the um, contraceptive pill is a hormonal medication that absolutely for some people will just eliminate their libido. And that's just one thing. And men don't take the pill, right? Men, women hmm. take the pill. Yeah, that's true. Uh, women give birth, you know, and it, that changes their body profoundly, mm -hmm. uh, not just in terms of, um, you know, physical function, but also hormonal changes over time. So, uh, so there are complications to women. Having said that, like I said, there have been cultures in the past uh, and maybe around the world, I'm not quite sure, where they saw women as much more horny than men were. And men were the ones like saying, enough woman, I don't want to have sex. And, you know, which culture would that be? Article. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, this one fictional, was this ancient, fictional culture you speak of. Where did the, well, one was the ancient Greeks, which is hard to know because it was a long time ago, but there are reports of, of, uh, women. If I remember my history, right. Uh, and men talking about how, well, you got you to gotta go home every once in a while and have sex with her. Otherwise, she's going to go crazy. Also, I think if I remember, again, it kind of caught me off guard. A uh, hundred years ago, 150 years ago, there were articles written in the United States where there was talk about how 
masculinity was more associated with action and war and occupation and Mm -hmm. out being in the outdoors. And women were associated with being at home and child rearing and sex was sort of lumped in with that. And so Hmm. it, it was, it was almost seen as unmasculine to have sex with your wife because it was above, it was of the home and, of children and all that, those kinds of things. Okay. So I, so was, I could be screwing that up a little bit. No, I think I think I, I the, I'm thinking of the Mad Men era. You're you're also forgetting the legend of the uh, master shoe salesman Al Bundy, um, <laughs> exactly having to satisfy Peg Bundy on a regular basis. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> that's that's a real phenomenon in our history. <laughs> Quick, okay, so like just before we get into the, all these awesome questions, what is the psychology of sex? Why do we love it? Is it just basic well, chemistry? Yes, in essence, like in the same way that we need food and water and safety and attachment and physical closeness, we're designed from birth or from conception, you know, to have certain drives, uh, sex being a primary drive, because it makes sense if you take, say, a tribe of humans 200,000 years ago in Africa and all of that, that gene pool has like half the sexual drive as as another tribe next door, then that tribe with the low libido in general is going to have less sex, right? And they're right. going to be less likely to procreate. And so that tribe, fast forward 100 years, is going to have a far fewer humans in that region than the tribe that had a high libido. Now, of course, there's a balance between uh, if you have too much libido, then you would neglect such thing as food gathering and child rearing and um, all you know lo- lots of other things. So our sexual libido was designed for the kind of uh, conditions that were upon us as we were evolving, uh, you know, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand years ago. Well, I know that when I'm done, I'm super hungry. <laughs> so if they don't, if they don't source the food, they go and die. <laughs> Right. So imagine if you just had sex all the time, like you would die of you know, starvation. Guy needs a sandwich every once in a while. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. So both Josh and I are married. And from a psychologist's point of view, how important is sex in marriage? I mean, we know it's important. I think everybody inherently knows it's important, but how important is it really? It depends on the individuals. For most people, it absolutely is a very important thing for a number of reasons. One is that it is a sexual need, right? That most people have, not all, but most people. Uh, You know, I should say that there are some couples who are perfectly happy not having sex ever. Uh, That's just how they are and they're they're totally cool with it. Uh, You've encountered that or you read about it? No, I've encountered it, yeah. They don't like to come out of the closet because they're shamed because Mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. you know, they're what's wrong with you? Oh, you don't really know what good sex is. And, and there's, there's a sizable amount of people who are just like, no, nope, I've looked into it and I'm just, you know, I love all the other things about life. I just don't, I'm just not into that. But for, you know, for most people it is uh, to varying degrees, a very important part for sexual need, for closeness, for bonding, for a lot of things related to sex and intimacy and bonding and attachment. Uh, just physical closeness. We clearly evolved like other social animals to be in physical contact with our kin. Mm-hmm. And in our Western society in particular, we're, we're pretty phobic, particularly for men to touch, uh, you know, two guys touching. It's like, Oh, it's, that's gay. And, or two friends holding hands, you know, you'll see other countries where two men who are straight will be holding hands, walking down the street. Uh, we, we, we need that kind of thing, but in our society, it's seen as this really, really, uh, disgraceful thing. You could, you could literally be killed if you walk down the street in certain communities, uh, doing something like that. And Hmm. so, so anyway, we have a lot of needs for attachment and, um, and for closeness and sex and sexual activity with our spouses, uh, meets all those needs. And so yeah. uh, we abs- it absolutely is an important part. And for those of us who do enjoy sex and want to have sex a certain amount, uh, to not have it can, you know, can feel bad. It, it's a need that's not being met for sure. Yeah. And we're going to get to that a little later. Um, okay. So here's a question. This is a good case. Okay, so I know a lot of guys listen to our podcast are going to really, really 
perk their ears up for this question. And this was something that I struggled with in my marriage. And it's, you know, for whatever reason, for whatever, for whatever, however you received these visions of sex or the things that you want, how do we ask for the things that we're scared to ask for? Desires. Desire. What, how are we, you know, some guys, some men could, they, they might be scared that their wife would be very upset that they would ask for something um, or think that way. And how did you receive, where did you, where did you learn that? Or why would you want me to do that? How do, how do we get into that with our, with our spouse? So I guess it's more a communication thing, right? But in this specific thing, I think a lot of men forego this conversation at their peril. And we'll get into what that mojo quiz, which is really cool. But I want to hear from your perspective. Some, you know, you've got a couple in your office and the husband is just not happy with the super vanilla sex they're having. And he's also scared to ask for something a little bit more for dangerous. Hot yeah, on top. You know what I'm saying? So how does he or her for that matter, because I'm sure it happens both ways. How do they bridge that gap? So you're asking how do you, how do couples ask for things that they're worried about their spouse not wanting to do or reacting badly even to the question. Is that what you're... Yeah. How, like, do, you, how do you navigate sexual experimentation? If you have something yes. you want to do mm-hmm. or try, I mean, I don't know what that is. Like, that's, that's a huge Well, range, what I find that as you get older, like I've been married for almost 12 years, even 17 years, I find as we get older in marriage, sex gets better, but you also want to start exploring different things. And so some, some guys are, I'm not saying I'm scared of it, but there are some things I'm not, I would not mention to my wife. Yeah, um, I would say that. I, you, I, would, I would admit that, that I'm, there's things that I would maybe want to ask, but yeah, there's scared. a fear of rejection, I think, or being judged or not wanting to have to <laughs> explain myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm just trying to figure out like what you would tell a couple who comes in for therapy, who says, look, the, the husband, she doesn't, she because it's probably easier to talk to a therapist as a couple to say, well, I want this and this and this. And then you, you're, it's because he's directing it at you and then you can like relate to her sort of thing. But how do couples come together and like really just lose the fear? Yeah, it's a complicated thing and it depends on the couples. But in general, the, the overarching thing is do the two people have a secure relationship where they can navigate these tense potentially tense issues Mm -hmm. where say for example one person says oh you know it's always been a dream of mine and i've i've never asked someone to do this but i I really want to do this kind of thing and the other person says something even if they're being super cool about it Mm -hmm. they're like um i let me think about that one and then they think about it and they're like you know what i i don't want to do that i i want to do it for you but i can't see myself doing that That's a pretty tense thing. You know, Mm -hmm. you have one person that's laying it out there. It's saying, this is a dream of mine. And the other person is saying, "Um, I can never be that person for you. And since we're in a monogamous relationship, you're never going to get that need met. And that's, you know, that's a tense situation. And that's in the best of situations where the two people are actually being pretty cool to each other. So you you need to have a secure relationship. You need to have a relationship in which the the two people have an established relationship security, an established love, an established way of communicating about these kinds of things, established trust in each other's feelings for, for each other. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the, the first thing is, is just having a, a relationship in general in which you can t- uh, manage those kinds of difficult conversations with each other. The second thing is, is uh, working on reprogramming, depending on the individual's cultural notions about sexuality in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, All of us in Western society, and I think around the world really, have been programmed to feel shameful about sex uh, entirely. Even just, uh, you know, culturally condoned sex (laughs) between men and women in marriage uh, who are, um, you know, let's say even they're procreating. It's one of those things that you can't really announce on Facebook, right? Right. And it, the, why is that? Well, you can announce you're going for a hike. You can announce you had a good burger. You can announce you even went to a massage therapist and enjoyed it. You can't announce that you had sex. So there's something about it in our society where it's just like disgusting or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so times that times a, a thousand for anything that's off the norm, like anything that's kinky. And 
which most of us have, by the way. In fact, I would venture to everyone I talk to about this, every client, every friend I talk to about this, you know, when, once you dig down deep and it doesn't take long, you discover everyone has something that's quote unquote kinky about them. And yeah. so therefore no one's really kinky because the definition of kinky means it's odd, but like everyone has something that's quote unquote odd to them because we have such a narrow definition of what isn't odd. Right. Um, and so, uh, when, you know, before talking about, so some people have, a lesser degree of that programming than others. Some people have intense shame based on their family when they grew up, based yep. on the mm-hmm. based on the religion they grew up in, mm-hmm. and and other people don't. And so, if someone has intense, like if your spouse has just intense shame around sexuality, then some care has to be taken at, that to that um, some some amount of of uh, account like accommodation has to be made you know mm. if your spouse is really sexually shameful you don't want to just lay something out there real quick because yeah. it's going to be hard for them here having said all that get to a couple therapist or a or a sex therapist both of whom are trained to help with this sort of thing it's um, something to be said too there in this day and age of consent is like that's a good thing you're finding out you know back in the day men just took what they want or whatever you, you could, the, the, the ideology was that way but Nowadays, it's like we're way, and that's for a good for a good reason. We're more, how do you say? We're more in tune with getting consent for things and asking and making sure it's all good because you know for good. And that's a good that's a good social change. I think that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, part of the reason for that in the past was that women weren't supposed to want sex at all, and so the only way that any sex was going to happen is if it was taken, quote unquote, by the man. Mm-hmm. And some women would even want to be quote unquote taken in that way because it would allow them the ability to have sex without admitting that they wanted to have sex because society was saying that they couldn't want to have sex. Mm. Um, that would have been a terrible era to grow. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. Sad. Yeah. Well, a hundred years from now, they're going to look back at us and say that we were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going to be like, man, were they sexually shaming in, in 2019? I can't imagine uh, the kinks in a hundred years. It's going to be like, if, Kink, kink shaming is a big thing happening right now. Don't kink shame me for my kinks. And you're seeing it being normalized um, a lot, especially in social justice circles and stuff like that. You're seeing people, don't kink shame me. This is my kink. And some people will even, they are, they are, that, they are that kink. They are their That's kink. That's their identity. Do you know what I mean? They, they identify, they, as, they a identify kink? as a kink or something like that. And they, they, these, they'll say, I am he, they, the, whatever, and my kink is this. And I'm like, oh, are we saying this? <laughs> it's like, that's how you introduce yourself. I've, I've seen that. And I'm, I think to myself that it's cool to normalize it. At the same time, it's like, don't overshare. You know, it's, I'm halfway there. Sure. Depending on the context, if you are interviewing for a job, that's probably not the place <laughs> to uh, bring that up. Hi, my name's, uh, I'm, I can type 75 words a minute and my kink is, um, but, you know, butt strapping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, certainly a context. And uh, but under some context, it's it's probably a good thing for some people to you know lead by example. The the last thing I'll say is when we're asking, when communicating, it's important to own our own feelings and to communicate in an assertive, kind way, but also kind to both people. So you you might mm-hmm. open it up with saying something like, "So I want to tell you something that uh, I'm very scared to tell you because." I have learned over time to be ashamed of this, and I, I've never really told anybody about this, and I haven't told you because um, I just wasn't ready, but I, I want to tell you about some sexual preference of mine, and you don't have to do it, but man, if you could, it really would be awesome, <laughs> but you don't, you don't, you don't well, have to, <laughs> but, but I... Yeah, well, that comes to the mojo quiz. This is a really cool thing. I'm never sure you've heard of this, Dr. Kirk, but... You go online, you, you answer all these questions. They're pretty kinky, not going to lie. Some of them are not as kinky as others. Some of them are pretty, you know, normal. Um, but they cover the gambit. Um, and I, I'm sure they don't cover the entire gambit because there are some kinks out there that are, like, illegal. Um, <laughs> but it covers the gambit. And if you fill out these question, this questionnaire, it'll send it to your partner. Um, and your partner will be able to answer the same questions. But, and then when it, when it sends you the answers to each other, it cuts out the ones that you don't agree with. Oh, it's like, it's like so, Tinder for kinks. Basically, so like, yeah, so you answer all these questions and then you're, you, my wife answered all the questions and then we sat down with our answers and it cut out the answers where I would say something, but she said no to, or she said yes to, and I said no to. We wouldn't see you those answers. See, you only see the things that you agree on. You only see the things you agree on and you're like, really? Oh, you do that? And then it was like, not, okay, my wife's going to kill me for saying this. It was super hot, by the way, to just do that. Just do that, that act of like, 
answer these questions honestly and like it's a little bit you feel a little bit I don't know spicy I don't know what the word is but you feel like oh this is cool and then getting the answers back your eyes are opened a little bit to like their inner it's an easier way to answer these questions without having a face-to-face conversation I thought it was yeah really cool. I, well you did have a face-to-face conversation eventually right yeah exactly yeah, I think that's great oh, that's yeah. cool all right, Jeff's got a really good question he's been dying to ask you. <laughs> Jeff, you do this, man. It's yours. Dr. Dr. Kirk, every time I come to you, <laughs> I've always Jeff can't wait for these sessions. He can't wait. Well, the funny thing is, is I, think, I don't know if people think we make this stuff up, but I, I'm not making this up. <laughs> so for me and my relationship with my wife, I, and I've, I've expressed this to her, I always feel like there's this point system that I'm always trying to like gain stars on a chart or something so that they can align and I can, uh, yeah, we can get to business time, right? And, but what I feel, and I don't know if there's psychology to this, if it's only with my wife or if you've seen this with other people or what, but I always feel like I can get a check. I can get a check. And I feel like, you know, we're getting close. We're getting close. Cause she always tells me she needs more, like she needs time to warm up. She needs to feel good about me, like emotionally, all these things. But I can do one thing. I can say one thing the wrong way. I can miss say one thing he misses the haircut calendar (laughs) schedule (laughs) no not that it's not that but like what uh, you know if if i'm perceived as being rude or if i'm perceived as being short or something like that within all of that i really feel like it just gets erased everything gets washed away i'm standing at the bottom (laughs) thinking i gotta fill this chart again so jeff's got 99 points it's like (laughs) seven o'clock everything's winding down yeah then something happens Hey, you get in, and you yell or do something. And maybe I'm ninety nine points are gone. Yeah, I, I, and yes, I do feel that sometimes. And and maybe Trish is going to be mad at me for saying that, but I, I just, I want to know what's up with that, and if I'm the only one that feels that. No, there are a lot of people, again, of every gender who experiences that. I feel bad for you, not in this. I don't, not in the sense of pitying, but I, I feel your pain. That that sounds like a lot of work to get, um, you know, your needs met. And uh, <laughs> I love it, Doctor. You know, why are you laughing at me? Do things sexually. Just basically what Doctor Kirk is saying. Jeff, shut your mouth. <laughs> no, no, Stop not at all. I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people in your shoes. In fact, some people are uh, that I talk to in my office are are so further down the road that they haven't had sex in five years, and so I know the suffering, and it's it's not. It's not pleasant. So the, there are two issues here. One is is that, and this relates to previous conversations you and I have had, which mm-hmm. is to uh, know your feelings and do your best to communicate about them. It's possible, I don't know, that your wife doesn't really fully understand your experience as you go through this. And if she did, she might better care for you. You might have less, you might have the same amount of sex, um, but you would at least feel like she cared. Cause one of the things that happens as an outgrowth of this kind of dynamic of a, a, someone with higher libido than someone else in general is the higher libido person can feel quite emotionally neglected and mm-hmm. because they feel like, don't you care? You know, don't you love me? Don't you want me? And for the low, lower libido person, they can feel like, yeah, I love you. I want to be with you. I just, I'm just not in the mood very often, you know? And so one of the things to focus on is, you know, you go to her and you're just like, so I'm going to tell you like how I, how, how I think and feel about our sexual life. Uh, I, I want to have sex X amount of times and we, we don't have sex that often. It's fine that we don't, I, I wish it was more. I, I'm not, going to divorce you over it but uh, i just want to tell you that i feel like i have to do everything perfect and if one thing gets out of whack then then sex is off the table and i just have to say it's a lot of pressure it's a big bummer to me it makes me it makes me feel like i'm playing a game that um, there's some kind of prize at the end and i just feel like our sexual life shouldn't be that way uh, I'm not blaming you for it, but I, I just wanted to tell you that's that's what's happening for me. And then you just have a conversation about that because maybe to her, it's less about the hundred check marks and more about like five of those check marks or something. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. or, or maybe it's like she's like, no, in fact, um, you could do everything wrong, and I'll still want to have sex when I want to have sex because 
my libido just kind of comes and goes. Um, mm. it, you know, it, there isn't really a, a system to it. Or another fa- another thing that could be happening is she has complaints about you, and she uses sex to motivate you, um, which is not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, there's there's better ways for her to communicate what she wants out of you to decouple that from from actual sexual activity. It would be a conversation, and it, it would it would take some time. The other thing is is like I said, treating couples who have different um, libido amounts, there are so many things that can be done. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to couples once we actually get into the conversation. Sometimes it only takes – I had a couple not too long ago who came to me for I think two sessions and completely recorrected their sexual life after they've been together for decades. Wow. So it, it, it's a talk with a sex therapist or a couples therapist or you know doing a mojo quiz or something – uh, it's it's amazing how very little conversation, open conversation, can totally recorrect things because mm-hmm. so much of it goes unsaid and so much of it is shameful and so much of it is tied in tension and history. And so I, I, have you had conversations with her along these lines? We have. And, and I, I wouldn't say that just I want to I want to put it on the record that the, the thing you said about um you know, using, using sex, for- yeah, as as a motivation. I I really don't feel my wife does that. Um, but yeah, we've we've had conversations, but I I just they sometimes feel uncomfortable, right? And and it's too bad. Um, what what bad happens? What bad thing happens? I don't know. I guess I guess I just <laughs> I guess I I end up just feeling bad. Like it's like badgering or something, and and I and I don't think I badger, but I feel like who would who would want to be with the downer who's just always not happy with what's going on? Does she say you're badgering? Does she indicate that you're badgering? No, she doesn't. But I guess it just I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I get it because when you repeat something over and over again, like we've been married 17 years, so it's come up over the years, and not all the time, not every day, not every week, not even every month. But it's come up. It's just I sometimes feel like it's just repeating the same thing over and over again. So maybe I'm saying it incorrectly. Uh, if things never go well, then working on the way the two of you actually communicate about it is probably in order. Uh, the yeah. other thing is is that being in a long term relationship is just a series of badgering your partner. Um, <laughs> it, it, there, there's there's the complaints are always the same. It's not like if you got a rid of this complaint, there would be this other side of the fence where there's never another complaint. Mm. Uh, people research shows that whatever complaint you have about your spouse within the first couple of years, you will complain about that for the rest of your life with that person. Oh, wow. it, it's, it's just the way yeah. that they think now they might, they might modify, they might get a little less, but the action of sitting down with your spouse and saying, so we got to revisit this thing again. And I know we've talked about it before and, uh, but I just, it's been building up in me and I feel like we need to course correct a little bit. I'm sure I'll talk with you about it again in some point, And I'm sorry for that, but um, I, I, I want to talk with you about that. And if you do it in a compassionate way, in a way that owns your own feelings in a way that allows her to be herself and to have her voice heard. And people tend not to consider that badgering. They, they just consider it like, oh, my husband loves me enough to have this conversation and I want to know what's on his mind. I know yeah. he's been in a bad mood lately. I'd rather have him telling me than uh, you know, giving me the cold shoulder. So, And I, I don't know if you do that, but that's a common thing that um, high libido spouses will do is it'll, there's this tension that gets created and the high libido spouse will be upset and will withhold some other thing like... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a cuddling or spending time or date night or something, there will be some kind of, you know, reciprocity and balancing of the, of the equation. And um, so it's not like being in that position is without its own pitfalls. You know what I mean? Yeah. You basically just called me out on my second <laughs> part of the, I wasn't going to ask a second question, but I was going to actually state for anyone listening kind of what ends up happening within me. And, and maybe this is something screwed up that I need to deal with. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the actual breakdown. So if, um, we do have sex, I feel great about it. And then the next day I'm probably thinking about it already. I'm thinking, wow, that was great. She thought it was great. 
this is awesome. We're both thinking it's great again. And then I may suggest something and it kind of gets either ignored or pushed aside. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. Like I thought we had a good time. And then the next day I'll come and it again. And what I end up start doing is I almost find it. And maybe this is something screwed up in me. Like I said, I almost find it easier to just stop thinking about it. So I push it away. Like I don't even want to pursue it anymore. And then I a hundred percent do. I'm not purposefully withholding something specifically, but I would definitely say that I try to turn down my emotions because my emotions make me feel like I want it more. Yeah. You're describing a very common reaction, maybe universal. Uh, and it's a natural outgrowth of um, the position that you're in. It, it, it's like, okay, I want to bring it up, but if I do, it'll come across like it's being pushy um, I have to turn off a part of myself, essentially, to cope with mm. this, but that doesn't feel good. Yep. Um, I'm walking around in a bad mood. Um, I get, you know, If I turn off that side of myself, I kind of also have to turn off the side of me that loves my spouse on, on some level. Um, mm. And it, it's a very difficult place to be, and no one is walking, or very few people are walking around going like, well, I'm going to get revenge on my spouse. It's, you know, it's, it's just a complicated thing. The, the thing that I've learned with couples over time is that we, we have this idea of what a marital sexual life is supposed to look like. And we don't consider all the other ways that it could look like. So mm -hmm. earlier I was talking about how we have a lot of different needs. You know, we have needs for sex. But they're very much related, if not the same, as our need for attachment and closeness. And for men, we've been socialized to get our needs for closeness through sex. Uh, you talk to young men, teenage boys, and they don't talk about holding hands in general. They don't, they don't talk about... Um, you know, staring into the eyes of, of their uh, partner. They talk about scoring and they talk about yeah. getting with somebody. They talk about mm. all these other kinds of things. Well, that's because society says that that's what men are. And, but what they're really expressing is, is this desire to uh, be close, to, to get physical warmth, to exchange that, which uh, comes during the sexual act, but also before and after. And so uh, I, I challenge you to, to think about all the needs that you have. In, you know, sex is one of them. It's not, it's not like hmm. you don't have that need to have an orgasm, for example, to, um, to I don't know, do particular sexual acts. Those are, those are absolute needs. But you also have needs for cuddling and closeness and love and physical warmth and, and just that, that, you know, because average sexual act is, you know, let's, let's, conservatively say five minutes uh 10 minutes maybe uh so but what about all the other stuff that happens before and after you know that this the the intercourse is stopped and now you're laying next to each other you're often naked you're skin on skin uh there's no tv there's no phones and and you're just staring um up at the ceiling and talking and uh laughing and you're you know you're together on this sort of stuff smoking a cigarette <laughs> yeah and apparently thinking about a sandwich. If, if <laughs> and a sandwich. Yeah. Or I'm yeah. snoring. Yeah. No, th there's actually, so this just reminded me of something that I honestly wasn't even thinking about before I walked in here. So I was feeling in one of these funks actually this week. And I did, I don't even know why I did it, but I just was walking past Trish in the kitchen. And I'm like, can I have a hug? Hmm. And we, she gave me a pretty good hug. And it actually felt really nice. And we didn't have sex, but... It still felt good. So, yeah, there's definitely more to it. And i got to stop getting so hungry. Right. So it's, it's, it's very possible that uh, um, a number of things can happen if you, if you shift your focus. So if you shift your focus more towards all the other needs, like all the ancillary things that might feel ancillary but actually are quite fundamental needs of yours, like hugging, like love, like, exchange, like eye contact – uh, like alone time, just the two of you mm. without distractions, you know, um, and you focus on those and try to get those needs met. It's probably easier for her to um, get in the mood for those kinds of things. It's possible that, you know, 50 to 80 percent of your needs will be met through that anyway, and you'll mm. feel less um, distressed. And it might actually give her needs met so that you don't have to do the hundred check mark thing and she 
feels more in love with you, feels more connected to you. And guess what? The libido kicks in. Not for everybody, but it can for a lot of people. I got to say this, and the libido thing is true. It's truth. You have a follow-up? So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I got to – Well, I guess cha- change your check marks yeah. to uh, all those physical warmth, eye contact sorts of things. Because yeah. um, you're definitely going to meet your both your needs in that way. And it might actually result in more sex. Hard to say, obviously, but it could. I find in my marriage that if I go above and beyond and just do things that, you know, just and not for not because I'm looking for something, but like I tend to get more. Like yeah. I just I, if I'm not looking for it and I'm going above and beyond doing things that, you know, make my wife happy. Generally, he's right. The, the, it's not about a point system, but you tend to, you tend to, can, you can bank some of that stuff. You can be like. Yeah, I, I feel actually what I'm hearing here, and, and it's funny how just verbalizing this stuff kind of makes you go, hang on a sec, I feel like I got to get my head or my butt a bit and yeah. stop feeling sorry for myself and just go move, get some. Move on. <laughs> nah, not, no, not that. Just stop doing that dumb thing because I, yeah. I think that's detrimental to me. Yeah. And now that I've verbalized it, I'm realizing you're kind of dumb for doing that. Like even if you told Trish and said, look, I feel like this point system thing sucks. Maybe she doesn't understand. Maybe she doesn't see that the way you see it. Yeah, she, but uh, she even wouldn't. just verbalizing it, she might think in herself, "Oh, Jeff's got ninety-eight points. He messed up once. Now he's like <laughs> ninety-seven. He, she might think about it. I'm just saying. Maybe if you don't verbalize, you don't conversate about I'm it. I'm gonna put up a chart know. and have stars. Actual she loves stars. those charts, dude. Just yeah, put it in the calendar. Get it in the calendar. Um, okay, <laughs> Doctor Kirk, I got a really. This is a question I think a lot of guys are gonna struggle with. Uh, myself as a believer, um, Jesus, uh, I'm a Christian. I consider myself a Christian. Um, porn is a huge thing in you know, in the world right now from a psychologist perspective, not from a religious or from a personal or whatever it is perspective, how, how bad or how good or whatever is porn in a marriage? Can can it like, uh, like, can it be good? Can it, or is it always bad? So the first thing I'll say is that there's a lot of different moral judgments that people will have regarding porn. So that is a massive factor, Right, right. right? But if, but if we get away from – or if we put that aside for a second and just look at the science behind pornography and its effect on people, in general, it's not a detriment to uh, individuals or to marriage. Most people look at porn and most people masturbate, men and women, mm-hmm. and it doesn't seem to be a, a very effective way of predicting whether or not a marriage will be – good or bad or whether individual will have good well-being or not it, it really doesn't it largely depends on your point of view mm-hmm. right but uh, in general it doesn't seem to be tied to that having said that there are situations for some individuals where it can absolutely be, become a problem one obviously is addiction it's a pretty rare condition to be addicted to pornography and masturbation but um, that can absolutely uh, cause a lot of issues that can result in well-being problems and also marriage problems but also it also seems that for some people they can't really they don't really understand what they're looking at when they're looking at porn and so they might think that pornography is the way sex is supposed to be and very very few pornography images are representative of of what typical sex is not to say that it's not good sex it's if if you want to have sex like the way people do in typical porn videos do then that's fine um and some people do obviously but it's not it's not the typical way if if you just took a camera and filmed all the people around the planet having sex <laughs> most just, <laughs> just throw up in my mouth. most of it would uh most and then you put it on a website you know most most people wouldn't want really want to watch it so it it's just it's just the way that things are you know and now maybe some people would but sure somebody has got but, that kink yeah, right. Not the king yeah, shit, exactly. right? For some people, not a lot, but for some people, when they view this stuff, they the, it distorts what they think they're supposed to be doing and what they think their partners are supposed to be doing, and it can mess with how they view their own sex, and they, they might not ever feel satisfied, or they might you know, be very pressuring to their partners to do particular things. But that's that's pretty rare. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So that I mean that's just I just a general. I know a lot of guys that there struggle with this because I know I know personally a lot of men and take out the religious aspect of everything, um, where if they their wives knew that they even jerked off or they looked at porn, that it would be like 
devastating. And to me, that's like, be real because 98% of men do this, even if they're married or not. And if you're not being honest with your wife about that, that, and she discovers it, like it's all like they can, they can be a level of betrayal that could be even, that could rival like cheating on somebody. Right. For some people, it is considered a form of infidelity. Um, not many, but for some it is for sure. And so all those things have to be talked about. And I've actually had couples and individuals in my office to talk about that very thing, to um, have a conversation about, you know, one person likes to look at porn and masturbate and the other person thinks it's cheating and we just have conversations. Often what it results in is a understanding for each other that they didn't really have prior. Because, again, we don't talk about this sort of stuff. Right. The person who doesn't like pornography might not really understand what the person who does look at pornography, what they get out of it and and why they're doing it. They might have a very distorted understanding. Like the person who doesn't like to look at porn, they could look at their spouse and say like, oh, well, you're only looking at porn because you don't want to be with me or I'm not good enough or or you're a pedophile or because you're you're some kind of sexual deviant Mm -hmm. or something. Um, There's often just a lot of misunderstanding about it. Now, for some people, they will find that even after we do talk about it, the person is still like, nope, pornography is off the table. I don't want my spouse doing it. If my spouse wants to do it, he's going to have to divorce me. That's just the way things are. And then we just go with that. We figure out some way of managing that. Yeah, I think. uh, But without talking about it, you just Exactly. I feel like if you're going to get into marriage with somebody, um, just be honest right off the top. Honestly, get all that stuff out of the way before you get into this legal contract and this like social and religious contract, get that out of the way before you get married. I think there's something to be said for people not having real conversations before they get married and the divorce rate. And I think they correlate pretty closely. We just just talked about multiple things where it's hard within your marriage to talk about sex. And then you're saying uh, before you get married, talk about what you want sexually and talk about, hey, this is also what I do on my own. Uh, that's a tough I think, conversation I think the kinks, to have. Uh, from, for especially as older, the kinks come later. And I didn't actually think about talking to these things until like, you know, f- 10 years down the road. You're like, you know, sex is great, but wouldn't it be cool if instead of at the beginning of a marriage saying, look, you, just so you, you're aware, I, I masturbate. That's because you <laughs> thought it was going to be Barnum and Bailey's when yeah, before you got married. True. <laughs> but okay. I mean, that's, I like that. That was a really, it was a really good, it was a really good answer. And a lot of people who struggle with that, it's, I think a lot of the answers are going to come to, especially with sex, any of this stuff is to get to see a couple therapist or a sex therapist because it, it will change the game for a lot of people. I think that's well, a safe place to talk. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I also want to kind of go back to what we were talking about before. Cause I, I feel like it's an important point to make, which is that, There are many roads to low libido for people um, Mm. that are not talked about because we don't talk about really much about sex. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that can lead to someone having a low libido. Uh, And what we often attribute it to is just gender, which is not a empirically sound conclusion. It can be uh, related to it sometimes, but there are uh, are many men who have no libido, by the way. So... Mm or low libido. Um, so there, there's, there's many things to think about. Plus same sex marriages. Usually there's a high libido person and a, and a low libido person in, hmm. in relation to each right, other. So that so, proves it there. It's true. Yeah. So it's not like it's, it's a, it's a thing that's only heterosexual relationships uh, struggle with. So, um, so there are many different ways. There's medical problems, obviously like, um, I don't know, thyroid issues or something, mm-hmm. uh, blood, blood pressure issues. Uh, like I said, the contraceptive pill is a hormone which can eliminate people's libido, just obliterate it. And physicians don't always review that with the patient very thoroughly. Mm. Psychotropics like uh, Prozac, SSRIs, anti-anxiety, any, um, uh, any depression, uh, antidepressants can also completely obliterate one's libido. Uh, wow. it's, it's, again, they don't talk about that very mm-hmm. much. And it's like, okay, I'm going to give you this pill and your depression is going to go away. But also, you're, you're never going to want to have sex. In fact, it'll repulse you to think about having sex. Not always, but that can be a factor wow. as well. Something um, to think about when you're taking these drugs or being prescribed yeah. is to ask your doctor, will this kill my libido? And it gives you well, or look it up on the internet, you know, because yeah, your doctor, yeah. your doctor might actually not talk about it very much because wow. they might be ashamed to even bring up the the notion. Um, 
pain if you're if you have back pain or some headaches or migraines or something or ongoing some kind of issue with pain that can eliminate ones i mean imagine being in pain and trying to get yourself into the mood it, it would be very yeah hard. that's true that's so true yep um, absolutely getting older uh, hormonal changes uh, women in particular have uh, a lot of hormonal changes as they age uh, that can absolutely change up or down one's libido Gaining weight, a lot of people gain weight, a lot of people have a lot of body shame, and they don't even want to be naked in front of themselves, let mm-hmm. alone their right. spouse. And this is a massive issue. There are so many people, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would imagine that most people in Western society, if you ask them, how do you feel about just standing stark naked in front of your spouse uh, most people would be like oh my god no that's awful i wouldn't subject them to that that kind of thing that's awful and to think about mm. getting in bed naked with your spouse um is uh when you have that much shame can be an absolute uh libido killer right. obviously st- obviously stress relationship uh divorce thoughts you know this kind of thing infidelity past infidelity uh, can throw a wrench into things Every time you have sex with your spouse, you're thinking about the fact they had sex with someone else 10 years ago. Having children, children around, uh, <laughs> that, that can abs- – everyone knows that. That's, that's an absolute – The door opens suddenly? Yeah. And just the <laughs> fact that they're out there somewhere doing something and you just – you have your focus on that. You think, okay, right. yeah. I got to keep my ear open to make sure that I don't hear them screaming or something. Just that interruption in your ability to just fully be present – can absolutely eliminate one's uh, libido. Obviously, sexual trauma, a lot of people have been traumatized yeah. sexually growing up, mm. a lot more than people realize. And that's just the list I can think of off the top of my head. There, there's so many other things that can lead to a libido change. And to fix the libido, so to speak, uh, to bring it back to its natural state, is uh, it's imperative that these things be addressed. It's imperative that um, all those things be assessed and, and treated and dealt with by the individual and by the couple. And a lot of people, they just, um, they don't even know that those things are interfering. So uh, I recommend everyone look into that as well. I've noticed one correlation between Zare's donuts and Trisha's libido. <laughs> the more Zare's donuts I eat, the her libido goes down. Her libido goes down. We have this, this uh, grocery store we live called Zare's and they have the best donuts on earth, like on earth. And they're so good, but they, they're like 800 calories a piece. Um, is there a is there an opposite food that gets her in the mood? No, nah, I'm just joking. Like, I just like I, like, like carrots or <laughs> <laughs> you probably celery or something like that. Something that's got negative calories. No, we were just joking a couple of uh, weeks ago. I said I can't walk by them, but I would like to report that I have walked by Zare's Donuts four times successfully now without picking one up. I'm going to go to the grocery store so much, man. Stop going to the grocery store. Yeah, okay. Um, last, okay, we'll get time into this. We can't go too long, but um, getting into the self love masturbation. <laughs> I wrote, can you go blind if you masturbate too much? We know you can't. But the, the self-love, the side of the marriage where, especially during a dry spell or your wife's pregnant or you know, right after childbirth, it was like six weeks, I think. Some people have to wait a little longer depending on what happens you know, tra- traumatically, um, all that kind of thing. The, the self-love and stuff like that, the guys who, who, who do that or women who, who go to that, is that, could that, is that okay? Is that healthy? Sometimes shame attached with it, right? Yeah. Uh, healthy to what again? You know, masturbate. Like if, like if for any reason, like uh, if I'm away for a week and, you know, I, or my wife just had a baby and it's been six weeks and, or, you know, for whatever reason, or just cause you're, you feel like you, you need to, you need to get rid of that stuff. <laughs> is it, is that okay? Like, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not asking permission, but I'm saying like these, these natural tendencies we've had since we were teenagers and puberty and all that stuff. Like those things are, those things as you get older, they're still natural, right? That's still something you should you shouldn't be ashamed of. Absolutely. The urge is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and the action is nothing you should be ashamed of. Uh, again, if someone doesn't want to do that because of whatever sort of reason, or if their spouse doesn't want them to do that, that's also fine uh, as long as it's communicated and cared for. But yeah, the way I would frame it is that uh, we have a sexual drive, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing long ago, in our species history, we figured out that uh, we could pleasure ourselves. Um, other primates will pleasure themselves. and You'll see infants pleasuring themselves uh, just without even knowing what it is. Uh, 
mm-hmm. it, it's, it's pleasurable. So, of course, we are driven towards pleasure and away from pain. And uh, so I, I don't know exactly how to answer the question, is it healthy or not? Um, there are a lot of good health benefits. Uh, I'll, I'll say that. That's good. See, there's a good <laughs> prostate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, mood, uh, hormones, energy, sleep, uh, I, I don't know the research off the top of my head, but there's there's a lot of benefits to orgasming in general and all, and masturbation as a. Subset I've heard of, of I've heard of this thing. The uh, I'm not going to say what it's really called. It's post orgasm clarity. It's called, and a lot of men will make decisions in that clarity moment. So what they do is they make they have a decision to make. They will masturbate, and then they will make the decision based on that clarity they receive after the orgasm. There's hmm. some kind well, of like thing there. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, there are monks of every kind who seek enlightenment. <laughs> I, I feel like Dr. Kirk just patted you and they go, there, there. Yeah, that sounds, <laughs> sounds not scientific That's at all. <laughs> anyway, well, that- the, well the, the, th- the one scientific thing I will say is that when we orgasm, when we have sex um, with ourselves or with other people, certain hormones and neurotransmitters are released that change the state of our mind, wow. which could lead to... Um, Clarity, so to speak, for sure. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think the way to answer this question is to go, "Hey, you can make your own sandwich too." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doctor Good, this has been amazing. Like, there's a lot of really great answers, a lot of really, you know, some eye-opening aha moments. Again, as usual, especially for Jeff. It was like, just, no, it's just like uh, it's, it's. There's a weight off your chest, even just. Hey, put it out there. Doctor Kirk's got the voice. He's got I the know. answers. He's calm. He doesn't like. He's good. Yes, he is. I wish we could just fly out to your clinic and just, <laughs> we could be your patients. <laughs> but we are digital and we appreciate it, Dr. Kirk. You're amazing. Well, it's fun to talk with you guys. It's always a blast. Awesome. Well, is, thanks for coming on. Is it hot out there right now? Yeah, what do you got? It is overcast. It is not hot. Oh. It is cold on it some was level. It a scorcher here today. Yeah, man. It's hotter than balls out here. Yeah, I heard about that. It's just nuts. Ball, yeah. get it? Yeah, it's yeah. hotter than balls. <laughs> right. I like that one. All right, thanks, Dr. Kirk. Sure.